I've never been to Cincinnati before. I was telling Josh when he asked me to speak, um, this is kind of a cool deal for me because my grandparents are from Covington. Uh, my grandparents, both of them, grew up on the same street in Covington. They married siblings. My grandpa's one of 12, my grandma's one of nine. And uh, they got married at 16 and 17. And as soon as they could, they wanted to move out of Covington and get away from Kentucky, which I hear is like a big thing these days. So my grandpa used to walk across the bridge to go to school in Cincinnati. He would, went to college here, like, I don't know, in the 40s or so. They got married, they moved to California, and he became a bazillionaire and worked his ass off. But when I told him I'm doing, I was doing a speaking gig in Cincinnati, he was actually very like, emotional about it because this is where his life started, this is kind of where our roots are, and it's really cool for me to see towns like Cincinnati that are now having an amazing tech scene resurgence because we need more of that. We need to get people out of the valley. So I'm excited to be here. I run a company called Code Support. We teach people who build web and mobile apps how to do awesome customer support. Uh, I started it about a year ago. So my talk is usually about cheap and easy customer support, but I'm adding in today some other stuff that I've learned building a business this past year because I've only been in business since January of 2011. Um, this is my first time running a business. It's my first time being an entrepreneur. It's my first time making money on my own. And I think that there's a lot of people in the room who are kind of in the same vein. And I wanted to talk about stuff that I've learned. So real quick though, how many people are building apps or have an app or doing app stuff? Okay, how many people care or want to care about customer support and doing customer support for your app? Shit, again, okay. <laughs> I thought we'd be able to move into the business stuff first, but first of all, let's just talk, who am I, what do I do? I used to work for a well-known company, I don't name. Uh, I started Code Support in 2011. I've done customer support for a very long time. My first job was actually when I was 16, working at a company that sold shit on the phone, like ShamWows and stuff. So uh, yeah, when, that was like 16 years ago, which is pretty crazy. This is a picture of me with the mullets. In fourth grade, this is sort of like my, my paramount moment. I try to pay, take people back to this moment because I've always been like this cool. Um, yeah, <laughs> you may have heard of my last job. Does anybody know where I used to work? Thank you, I don't say their name out loud. They're a very great company. They did really smart things while we were there working there and so we're gonna talk about some of those smart things that sort of uh, encouraged our industry to do more smart things in the past few years. One of those things is that they, when they launched their product, their flagship product, they had no support staff whatsoever. I was the very first support person. I was not even hired to do support. I was hired because I begged them for a job and I sent them cookies every month for about two years so I could work there. So I took over support because their reputation online was not awesome because they were really not cool to their customers. They hired me after three years working there, they said, you can actually do customer support and that's all you will do. And we will invest in customer support because after three years they figured maybe we should do something about that. But the problem still was that customer support was never, ever, ever as important as any other product development. It never got as much time or attention. It never got as much resources. It never got as much money. Support was always, always an afterthought. So the problem with this is that this company that I worked for, nameless company, this Voldemort of a company, encouraged a lot of people to develop apps and products this way. They said, you don't have to listen to your customers, just build your app, just build whatever you wanna do with your own features, say no to feature requests and all this stuff. And so people started doing that. And now we realize years and years later that we have to care about our customers, that customers have access online to more places to bitch about you than ever before. They can do it anonymously, they can do it on Twitter, on public, they can do it anywhere they want and the consumer is king right now, which is a really unfortunate place to be in if you're building products because you have to cater to them. So what I wanna talk about is how we train people who are small teams, who have no support staff, how to do great support. And part of that is starting with email forms and inboxes. Do you guys do email support on your own? Anyone? Is anyone here paying for a help desk solution? Like, yes. 
you shouldn't be because you don't need to. You should be using Twitter, you should be using Facebook, you should be using Gmail, that's all you need. Those are three free resources that you should not do anything for, just FYI. So secondly, how many of you guys have heard of TurboScan, the iPad and iPhone app? Anyone use it? You are you're, you're usually no or you say yes? Okay, feel free to raise your hands and ask me questions during this too. I want this to be like more classroom style than anything. And if I see you nodding your head, I might ask you to elaborate on something. TurboScan is one of the top paid iPhone apps of all time. They're huge. You take a picture of anything, it turns it into a PDF. It's great for contracts. I use it all of the time. Uh, I think it's like $2.99 or $3.99. They've made a shit ton of money, easily over $2 million in a year selling this iPhone app. This is their support page. TurboScanApp.com, please send us an email. We answer most support emails within a few hours, which is a lie because they don't, because I've emailed them 14 times since December and they haven't written back once. So this is a company, their app is like all over, top productivity, anytime we go to the iTunes store and I say I wanna work, I wanna be better worker on my iPad or iPhone, what should I buy? This is what you get. It's terrible. We have another customer Goodreader, anyone heard of Goodreader? It's a PDF reader for the iPad. They're one of our customers. They brought us in to help with their support because they didn't know what they were doing wrong. Well, one of the first things they were doing wrong was this situation. They had an email address on a website. They had no other resources. They couldn't gather any information from their customers. They weren't gathering any information from their customers. And their email inbox looked like this, which is pointless, right? Imagine getting 200 of these a day where the subject is the name of your website. <laughs> it's idiotic. It's not what you want to do at all. And the problem is stuff like this makes people hate doing support. Stuff like this makes people who are developers and designers who do not want to do support all day hate looking at their inbox. So instead, what we did is what we do for several of our customers, like we did for our customer readability. We created this form that allows a customer to simply choose what their issue is. This is the simplest thing in the world. This is, even, this is even built into like something like desk.com. You can do this right now. We give a person an option to actually choose what their issue is. So now your inbox looks like this. We're tagging things. We're keeping metrics on how many people are reporting iCloud issues. We're getting a subject that people can actually fill in and give you an idea of what's priority here. Which one should I answer first? Because before, all of them had the same subject. That's gonna make you wanna do support. That's gonna make you wanna realize that like, this is actually a problem I should fix. We've gotten 15 iCloud feedback issues right now. We need to get on iCloud and we need to fix iCloud, that kind of stuff. So that's one thing you can do, but you can take it even further if you have multiple people using a free resource like Gmail. Another one of our customers is Kissmetrics and they use Gmail. This is a picture of their Gmail inbox. That's it. So we have all of our customer emails in one place. We have labels being used. Labels are even being used for people's names so that when Cindy comes in, Cindy just has to look at her label. That's called Cindy and all the emails she needs to go for are right there. Yes. <coughs> a lot of people do. A lot of people share a login. And again, this isn't a personal email address and these are your employees. So if you have problem trusting your employees with an email address, then you've got the wrong employees. Um, secondly, it's usually like a support at something email address. It's not someone's personal email. Is there another question? No, okay. Anyway, so this is a great way to do the exact same thing that we saw before where people are writing in and we're tagging these things. So at the end of the day, I can go in and see how many of these have the little red bug on them. How many of these say Eric, because Eric's our dev. How many emails did he actually have to get involved with because something's wrong with the app or it's too complicated that our support person couldn't do it? Beyond this, Kissmetrics also does this same thing that we saw with readability. They allow you to kind of do this drop down of issues, but then at the top they say, have you visited our support site for help? Which means that they're offering amazing searchable documentation online. Another super, super easy thing to do. If you don't want to do support and you don't want to answer 100 emails a day, write better documentation. End of story. Every single help item you have should have no more than four sentences and they should all have a screenshot. I don't care if you use the same screenshot and different facts, you can use them over. This is the kind of screenshot you need to have with a big blue X saying that's where you need to go. It's easy to make, people can do it for cheap. So this is what we made for readability when they didn't have anything. We made them a searchable help section. It's got a box in it, everything is keyword tagged. 
Everything is in categories. So when I go to iTunes and I say, I'm having a problem with this app I bought, I'm going to go to their support site and see this shit, I can get all of my answers like right here without having to bother anyone. That to me is like a developer's wet dream. You don't have to bother me ever again with any questions about this app. I've given you all the answers. So any questions about that or how to build it or who should do it? Sweets. Next one, this is easy, prioritizing. There's two facets to prioritizing answering emails and they have to do with something's broken, I can't log in, this isn't working, I need help or have a billing issue. These are your most important things ever because these are paid customers and paid customers leave reviews. They leave reviews everywhere. They can leave a review in your mailbox at your house. They can write you a letter. They can do it in iTunes. They can do it on Yelp for God's sakes. I'm seeing Yelp reviews for apps these days. That makes no sense to me. <laughs> it makes no sense. But what it does show is that customers are venting because they're angry. They, you know, that's what happens when you're angry that you want to anonymously vent about it online. So these are the things that you want to scan your inbox for. When you're tagging your inbox, when you're reading subjects, this is what you need to look at. There's a guy in the back yawning, so we're going to move over <laughs> to the next stuff real quick. This stuff doesn't matter very much. They all need answers, but these can be scripted answers. Have someone who's a good writer write you a standard stock response to feature requests that doesn't sound robotic and send it to every single person who requests a feature. If you do this for the first year, you'll see that a, you're actually getting really great responses from customers saying, hey, thanks for the response on this. And B, you're saving a lot of time that you can put into development and design. Later on, you can go through and answer and actually read them and all this stuff. Text Expander is your friend. Anybody use Text Expander? How long have you guys been using it? Three years? Yeah, I've been using it about four or five years myself. It's an amazing product. You write scripts in it, stuff that you do all day long. It works great for code snippets, too. And then you use keyboard shortcuts to send the reply out over and over. Next thing, Twitter. How many of you guys use Twitter for customer support? A few of you? Yeah, it's kind of hard to use. People use it for branding a lot, but they don't use it for customer support. I personally don't like Twitter. I'm not a huge fan of Twitter. It bothers me for a lot of reasons. Um, but it's a, the best free resource out there right now for customer support good customer support and bad customer support. Keep in mind that doing customer support is not just responding to people and saying, I'm sorry. That's not what it is. A lot of it is just engaging your customers and building relationships with them and sharing the praise that they have for your app. So I want to show you guys my very favorite customer support feed on Twitter. Uh, anyone, can anyone guess who it is? Best customer support on Twitter. Any ideas? No ideas? It's Taco Bell. It's Taco Bell. Taco Bell is the best. <laughs> this is customer support at its finest right here. <laughs> Look at this. This is some kid that they hired. He's an intern who goes to college part time. And they said, you have free reign to talk to our customers however you want. And this is how he's speaking to them. This is my favorite one up at the top here. I think the Doritos taco sucks. That makes you and nobody else. <laughs> <laughs> Like, that's their corporate response. That's from a bazillion dollar company saying that to people on Twitter. Like, who thinks like this? There's more. Do you guys sell hot dogs? Let me check. No. <laughs> this is kind of awesome to see this stuff happening. I'm amazed that they let this happen. I'm amazed that it's happening, but I'm amazed that they continue to let it happen. There's a whole conversation my friends and I had about Cool Ranch taco shells that are coming pretty soon. Like my friend Alan Branch here says, things I plan to do this weekend, eat a Doritos ta Locos taco, repeat step one about five times. And Taco Bell responds to him and says, pacing yourself is overrated, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> like my friends and I, and these aren't like my, my friends' friends, these are my internet friends. Alan and Tim who work for Less Everything, and like we're sitting around talking about this amazing Twitter feed. This is what you want for your brand, but you can only get there if you're using the tool the right way. You can only get there if you're fun, if you're friendly, if people like you and are noticing it. We, this is Corey who says, Taco Bell misses no tweet, leaves no taco related tweet unturned, keep up the good work. That's what you want people to respond to your brand with. And again, like they respond to him, they respond to everything, it's insane. 
So what we learn from that and what we learn from this idea of Twitter, and it works for Twitter, it works for Facebook, it works for any free uh, online public forum. Language is important, but so is having fun. And that means having fun with your brand, not taking yourself very seriously, using fun words, making people laugh. It will endear people to you. Being honest, all that stuff is amazing and fun. Okay, so next one. Empty words. A lot of you guys have heard me talk about this online because I'm trying to phase out words from the English dictionary <laughs> and I'm so far not having any luck because I have to keep telling people this. Words you should never ever use to customers, whether you're on a public forum like Twitter or you're doing private email, you should never use the word feedback. Anyone know why? No, because feedback is the sound that a guitar makes when it gets too close to a microphone. You don't ever want to call a customer idea feedback. It's terrible. It makes customers want to kick you in the face. Content, inconvenience, that isn't, this isn't, we don't, we won't, we can't. All of these are aggressive, shut down words that customers do not need to hear and do not want to hear. So what you want to do is start replacing these with full words. I even had a customer use autocorrect uh, on his computer that every time he typed the word inconvenience, he would, it would replace it with this trouble you're having. Just because he couldn't get it out of his mind, but he knew what he wanted to say to the person. I think that's a little, uh, you know, overboard, but anyway. Full words, thank you, I'm sorry, not we apologize. We apologize makes me really unhappy. I'm sorry is better. Being honest with people saying this sucks, it's a bug. It's okay to tell people that they've hit a bug. It's totally okay to tell people that they've uncovered something you need to fix and work on. Praising people, you're right, great idea, thanks for the vote. We saw that with Taco Bell. They just said, hey, thanks, we're trying, when someone said you're, you're good, whatever. I don't know, I don't know is a big one. A lot of people don't like saying I don't know, especially with feature requests. People say, we have no ETA, or that may come later on. Just tell them, I don't know if we're ever going to add that. That's what people want to hear. It's surprising, but that's what customers want to hear. So. Everyone get that? Anyone else yawning? No, okay. <laughs> Support is important as code and design. We all agree that. Invest in, in it equally as you would code and design. If you're going to hire a support person, remember that you might as well like, pay them the same that you're going to hire a designer for. They're doing the same kind of job. They are not low people on the totem pole doing the shitty work that no one wants to do and they shouldn't be paid as such. Uh, keep your support fast, friendly, educational, and fun. Be like Taco Bell. Go make money. Okay, so that ends the support portion of the talk. <laughs> so I want to talk about like other stuff. A lot of you guys, like this is what I really want to get to. So I'm sorry if I rushed through the first part of it, but if you have questions about it, you can ask me afterwards. I'll help you with support. I think what's more important is we talk about what it's like building a business by yourself right now in the internet age, in a tech space where your tech doesn't have to belong to other people and it doesn't have to belong to big founders and it doesn't have to belong to a, a team. You can be one guy who built an app and makes 30 grand a month. I know a lot of people like that. Two of my customers are single founders and they're making over a million dollars a year by themselves writing iPad apps. So what I've learned this year I want to bring to you guys, and I know that I'm also very lucky because I've, I've been in the tech space a while and I have really great friends who like a lot of people know about um, and I'm not going to deny that that's that luck is there I've learned a lot from them there's no sense in me not sharing it so one of the first things that I've learned is never ever 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 lean deep into business advice given to you by someone who doesn't have a fulfilling and healthy personal life we take a lot of advice from a lot of bullshit people we know nothing about a lot of people who write business books and they go on the Today Show and you see them, their books all over the place and they're telling you how to do things. We spend $20, $12 or whatever money on it and we know nothing about them. The people that you want to take advice from are people that you vetted, sort of. And you know that they have a healthy life outside of their business. You know that they have hobbies, probably not race car driving, but friends and family and people who like them Stuff that they do outside of work that makes their work inspiring. That's like important. Secondly, you don't need to take money from strangers, but you do need to take their advice and resources instead. Does anyone know what I mean by that? Any ideas? Nope, okay, so if you're in your first year of building a business or second year and you're seeking funding, you're 
not doing the right thing. The reason why is you may as well just max out your credit cards or take a loan from the bank and just stay independent and in control. When you take money from strangers, you lose power and you lose leverage and you lose a lot of time negotiating taking money from strangers. If you want to partner with someone, you should partner with them for their resources. You should partner with them because they have access to attorneys and accountants and people who can help you write contracts and people who know people in the app store and all of that very important business stuff that we don't think about when we're building apps and products. You don't really need people's money. You should make your own money. And you can do that if you have the right resources and the right partners. I'll wait till you get the photo. <laughs> okay, so next one. Surround yourself with people who don't give a shit about what you're building, but love who you are and not the opposite. We do the opposite of this way too much. We spend way too much time in the tech scene, reading tech blogs and tech Twitters and whatnot. And we do not stay grounded with people who don't give a shit about that stuff. Because when you surround yourself with people who don't give a shit about this stuff, but really want to care about who you are and your relationship with them, then you become one of those people who's building a business who has a really solid personal life. And that personal life is what makes you good at what you do and it makes people look up to you and want to listen to you and want to take your advice. Next one, and this is, this is probably more hard hitting and sometimes people don't agree with it, but I agree with it. It's okay to give away your ideas and to talk about them. You're not going to lose money by talking about your idea you have for an app. You shouldn't, <laughs> NDAs are bullshit. If anyone asks me to sign an NDA, I have no reason to talk to them ever again in business because it's bullshit. NDAs are fear in a contract. That's all it is. So remember that you'll make money by executing the most elegant and harmless and interesting version of idea, not by being the only person to try. We are not in an age where people are inventing new things right now. Maybe. I mean, the sham wow was pretty amazing. I'll give that guy credit. <laughs> I'll give him credit, and I have a Vidalian on onion slicer, and it is pretty cool. But it's a knife at the end of the day. The sham wow is a towel at the end of the day. It's a towel sponge, I don't know. But <laughs> it's great. It's great is the end of the story. The thing is, these aren't new ideas. These are great versions of ideas. So talking about something, every game's been made on the iPad already. Every productivity app has been made on the iPad. Do the best version of that, and you will make money. Do not worry about someone stealing your idea and going to do whatever. If a person steals your idea, most likely it's not going to be the best, ver best version of that idea. Okay, next one. If you're building a business, if you've quit your job to start a business, if you are all alone by yourself doing this or with one other person and you are trying to, you're struggling through, go to therapy if you need to. Tell them you're starting a company and they will do the rest. It's serious business. I mean, <laughs> I heard somewhere, I read, excuse me, I read somewhere that the number one reason that people go to therapy these days is because they're transitioning in careers. And so there's therapists who actually are studying this phenomenon. They're studying the phenomenon of young entrepreneurs and they know how to deal with it emotionally. This will make you a better person. When you're a better person, you make better shit. That's all there is to it. You have better ideas when you're a better person and people like you. Speaking of which, don't be a dick. <laughs> You don't need to be a dick. Swagger is not something you need to be successful. You may become su successful despite being a dick, but people will not like you. And if people do not like you, they will not buy shit from you. And if they buy shit from you and they don't like you, they're going to talk about how they hated the fact that they bought it from you because they don't like you. And if they have to buy it from you because you are a resource that maybe their company forces them into, they will still tell people, I hate that we have to use this product because the people are dicks. Yes. <laughs> I'm not really sure what you're talking about there, sir. Um, but people don't want to spend money or give money to people who are dicks. That's the end of the story. I want to give money to people that are fun and friendly. The Taco Bell thing is a really interesting thing for me because I was telling, my mom saw me speak and she uh, saw the Taco Bell thing and she was like, that's so weird because you've never eaten Taco Bell. I'm like, I know. I've never eaten Taco Bell. I can't believe that someone who, like me, hates Taco Bell so much that I'm sitting here talking at conferences about how awesome Taco Bell is. That is a, an amazing brand. Secondly, if you want a mentor, find someone who's amazing and ask them to buy them dinner. Do this for, for a few months until they offer the next time. If a mentor wants to hang out with you, they will pay for it. They will buy you a drink. They will say, I want to hear what you're doing. Do not 
be begging people to have coffee with you. That is not what the slide means. <laughs> if someone doesn't want to talk to you about your idea and give you advice about being in business, stop focusing on them. They're the wrong person to want to take advice from. The right people to take advice from are the people who are willing to listen to you and give you the advice. Remember that unkind people are maniacally unkind to themselves first and foremost. It makes their unkindness towards others more sad than annoying. You will probably face a lot of really unkind people in your journey to building an app or a company or a brand and making millions of dollars. You will never make millions of dollars unless you meet very mean people along the way. That's just how it is, the Grinch lives. But remember that it's not about you and you shouldn't take this personally. And you know, one of my very favorite lines ever is from What About Bob, which is like the best movie ever made, where the therapist is talking to him about why he doesn't have friends and why his wife left him. And he says, you know what? If a person doesn't like me, I just say, Bob, this one's out of order. I'm going to hang up and try again. And it's like, that's how you have to think about this kind of stuff. It's not all the time about you. Their meanness is about them. So just move on. Next thing, ask advice from everyone, even your customers. Your customers buy your app, they're gonna pay you money for it, they're gonna do in-app purchases, they're gonna do the next version, they're gonna do the next level of service. Ask them what they wanna know. Ask them what they want in their app. Ask them what they want to see happen. You cannot promise to them you're gonna make everything happen, obviously, but you can listen. And even being asked what I want is good enough for me. Even if you're never going to fulfill that promise, the fact that you care enough to know is important. But secondly, this is the same for anyone who does business stuff that you follow on Twitter, anyone who's inspiring you that you follow on their blog or Seth Godin or whomever. Successful people want to share their advice with you. They do. When you are a success and you love what you do, you can't contain it and you want to hear from someone saying, I'm just starting out, what advice can you give me? Never think that someone's gonna write you off or be mean to you or whatever because you ask them for advice. Uh, one of my favorite people in the entire world, Heaton Shaw of Kiss Met Metrics. You guys might have seen him speak before. He's all over the internet. He's adorable. He is really like a bazillionaire. He made his first million dollars when he was 19 in college. I don't even know what he was doing at that point. But he is so open. He's like, here's my phone number. Here's my email address. Anything you want. If you know someone, I say, you know, I have a friend who's kind of doing this. Hey, have him email me. And he doesn't have to be that way. He's a very busy, very successful person. He wants to be that way. There's a lot of people out there who want to be that way. Find them and seek them out. Secondly, find a spiritual center. Secondly, this is kind of going with the three slides ago, secondly. But find a spiritual center that's bigger than you and spend time thinking about it, especially if you work more than 12 hours a day. This doesn't mean God or Jesus or, or Catholics or Mormons or whatever. Um, it means something bigger than you and bigger than the work that you're doing. Because again, this gets back to this whole idea of when I take care of my mind and myself and my friends and my family, I will build better shit and people will pay me more money for it. The higher quality stuff I build, the more money I will make from it, but I cannot build high quality stuff unless I am a high quality person at the core of who I am. And finally, be good to your body. Don't eat at your desk, get enough sleep. I go to so many conferences and read so many blogs where these guys are like, yeah, we just got to bro it out, man. There's so many times I just work and I don't even remember to eat lunch. And I'm like, well, <laughs> you're not doing yourself any favors at all. Oh, man, I was up till 3.30 in the morning coding last night. Well, you should have gone to bed. You probably could have gone to bed, gotten three more hours of sleep, woken up early the next morning, rested, and made better work. Maybe if you were building stuff better and easier and cleaner from the beginning, you wouldn't be up until 3 in the morning trying to finish it or rewrite it. This is simple stuff. This is simple stuff. We don't hear it enough in our tech space because our tech space is all about damaging your body, ruining your mind, staying up all night, like working odd hours and all this stuff. You don't have to do that. And if you focus on, again, being good to yourself, being good to those around you, being a really good, fun person that people want to listen to, I swear to you, you'll make money. So that's the end. <laughs> Any other questions before we are done? <laughs> More questions? Wendy, do you have a question? Wendy Owens, novelist? No questions? OK. Any more questions? Do we have time left, or should we take a look? Oh, one question. Yeah, so your examples are all in English. Um, what about people that don't speak English? My examples for what?
You shouldn't try unless you can do it fluently. Um, Yep. Yeah. So uh, Goodreader is a customer of mine. That he gets about 200 emails a day that we process for him, and he's Russian and he's in Russia, and the majority of his customers are Russian speaking because he's very popular there, right? So because he's a new app. And because his resources are limited, we tell people in a Russian translation, we can only provide support in English right now. And it's a really shitty thing to do, and I hate that we have to do it. But at the end of the day, I would rather give clear, concise, educational support to someone in my own language than give them wrong or inefficient support in a language I don't know very well. Right? And I think the customer would rather I do that as well. When you're big enough and you can afford resources, I would figure out what's the second most popular language that people are writing in and hire someone who speaks that language fluently. That's, that's kind of a down the road sort of thing. And I know it's not the best answer, but you should really focus on doing what you do well. And part of that is speaking English. <laughs> right? So, OK, anyone else? Anyone else? If we don't ask questions, we have a longer break before speakers. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm all done then. Thanks, guys.